Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O'Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for stopping by my neck of the woods here. And a good time to drop in because we have the modern hermeticist himself in the house. Dana Trell is here to talk all about translating one of the preeminent texts, maybe the preeminent text in the history of Western esotericism, the Picatrix. And some of you are surely familiar with this text, but for those who are not, it is perhaps the premier book written on the subject of astrological magic, a manual for constructing talismans, mixing magical compounds, summoning planetary spirits, and determining astrological conditions. Originally composed in Arabic around the 11th century, it was then translated into Latin in the 13th century, and it is that Latin translation that Dan and his co-translator David Pereka have worked with to produce this new English version, which offers important insights not only into occult practices and beliefs, but also into the transmission of magical ideas from antiquity to the present. Now, Dan is an intellectual's intellectual, as I like to think of it. He's an historian, classicist, philosopher, and musician. He has a Bachelor of Arts in History and Classical Studies, a Master's in Ancient Mediterranean Cultures from the University of Waterloo, with a thesis on shamanic motifs in the ecstatic mystery rites of Addis and Cybele. He's also completed a post-baccalaureate in classics at UCLA, focusing on the translation of ancient Greek and Latin texts. And he is currently at the University of Waterloo doing his PhD in history on Renaissance Hermeticism, Platonic Orientalism, Medieval Religion, and Science. Some of you also know Dan from his Modern Hermeticist YouTube channel, where he has more than 30,000 subscribers and has produced some of the most in-depth material on the subject of Hermeticism in his series of lectures called Encyclopedia Hermetica. So that is Dan Attrell, and this is our conversation about the Picatrix. Enjoy! All right, Dan Attrell, man, longtime fan of yours. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Ryan. My pleasure to be here. I'm a fan of the show. Yeah, thanks so much, man. Uh, I know you've checked it out a few times, and I do appreciate that. You know, I'm a fan of yours, Dan, because you've crafted this persona online, uh, which stems from your offline interests, and the persona is the modern hermeticist. And hermeticism is the reason I'm doing this podcast, and I've talked about how I discovered it and got into it many times on the show here. But I'd like to know how you discovered the hermetic tradition, you know, where, when, what was happening in your life. Give us the origin story of the modern hermeticist. So I suppose I came to hermeticism obliquely. Because I was very interested in mystery cults and religion and philosophy and Gnosticism and basically everything that is tangentially connected to Hermeticism without actually getting involved in Hermeticism until I was in my, I suppose, mid-twenties. Before that, I was a student of the classics, so... My interests were chiefly in reading Plato and reading Homer and these kinds of Greek and Latin texts. And I also had a big interest in the reception of those texts in the Islamic world. So I did a lot of studying in school about Islamic history. And as I sort of compiled all these different vectors, eventually Hermeticism emerged as this synthesis of all of these different things that I had been studying. And perhaps a synthesis is only one way to talk about it, because if we're going to talk about late antique hermetism, it had certain doctrines, it had certain ideals that it held to, that it understood itself in reaction to other similar movements like Neoplatonism, like uh, Gnosticism. So often it's said that You know, Gnosticism and Hermeticism have a lot in common, but the difference is that one is world denying and the other one is world affirming. And I would like to think that I personally fall on that side of that divide, especially in conversations about modern Gnostics or modern Gnosticism. I think I would participate in a shared language community with them, but there's a lot of differences in terms of. Uh, doctrines and beliefs and and how you feel about theurgy and ritual and these kinds of things. So 
Yeah, my my approach to hermeticism was chiefly an an academic one on the one side, and then the other vector, perhaps you would call psychedelia, you know, experimenting with all these various uh, substances and and using those in a ritualized and meditative setting and trying to really explore inner landscapes. And so I eventually began to use the things that I was learning from my classical studies, from my studies of religion and philosophy, and try to bring those to bear on personal experiences. And I suppose one of the fruits of that was the Encyclopedia Hermetica, where just like you said that this A Culture series was designed for you and your journey to wrestle with the material, that's sort of what the Encyclopedia Hermetica was, right? When I started it, I didn't feel as if it would, you know, gain as much traction as it did. And I certainly didn't think I was doing it for a large audience. It was really something I was doing kind of like journaling or putting together notes for friends. So this was like, I like sharing my opinions and my knowledge with my friends, but I also hate lecturing at people when they're not receptive to it. So I thought the best way to do this, to share my knowledge, to share how I see the world, is to put it on a recording. And then if somebody wants to go see that, they can go and, and listen to it and, and hear me sort of working through my thoughts. And that way I don't have to have these kind of long patronizing conversations in real life where, you know, you go off in these divergent topics that other people may or may not have any interest in. So the idea was just to come up with this big picture. So like, what are all the constituent parts that would eventually make up hermeticism in that syncretic atmosphere of late antiquity? And so I started by, you know, mainly exploring. I started with the dawn of civilization and a very uh, chronological way of doing things. And I wanted to evoke the sense of a chronicle in the early part of the show, because that's kind of how history was done in the early Bronze Age. There was no grand scheme of history or ideas about the flow of time in history. It was very much a new thing. So they were more interested in chronicles and annals and things like that. And so I, I did that. And then eventually, as the time moved on and we roll into the axial age, the amount of information that is available grows. And so there's a lot more that you can say. And from that point on, I started writing scripts, synthesizing more material and taking it more seriously because more people were tuning in. It wasn't just, you know, five of my friends. So basically, I've gotten all the way to, I suppose, the second century B.C., which isn't even really proper hermitism territory yet. And I've got a long way to go to keep going. It's just that I started school and I'm doing my doctorate right now. And that takes four years and that's a lot of work. So Encyclopedia Hermetica is on pause for a little bit. And I'll come back to it once I've got, you know, a firmer grasp of the material. But I think that this is actually really good because definitely I, I think I started the encyclopedia in 2015, 2016, I think, or maybe earlier than that. In any case, it's I've learned a lot in, in the process. And there are certain things that I don't share the same opinion anymore. And there are certain things where, you know, new information has come to light or I was working from a really old and outdated book, which is uh, that happens a lot, actually, as publications get published. It's like this new Picatrix edition that we just put together. If you look at the bibliography in it, like a good chunk of the books are published in the last 10 years. And our picture of Western esotericism, of hermeticism, of Gnosticism, of all these different things has really changed a lot in the last decade. And so... I'm always going to be revisiting that material and hopefully correcting it and we'll see how it goes. And yeah, that is sort of my journey into hermeticism is a 
a twofold one. It, half of it came from an academic perspective and then the other half from an experiential perspective. And the thing is that when you're talking about this stuff, you're talking about mystical experiences, right? And a mystical experience what that means is an experience which can't be rendered into language, which cannot be condensed for an audience. Like the, the words that you use would not accurately symbolize the thing that was experienced. So there's not much you can say about the contents of the mystical world in an academic setting. So those two worlds become very distinct and I try not to let them mix too much they do obviously overlap in some sense that the interests are there, but uh, they're different perspectives, definitely. I try to take what I guess Fouter Hanegraaff calls uh, methodological agnosticism. I try to use that approach when it comes to scholarship and when it comes to my first person experiences, well, it's difficult to talk about them because that they're so bizarre, they, they can't be rendered into language very well. Yeah, man. And just to go back to what you said earlier about why you started the Encyclopedia Hermetica and why I started the show. I mean, we essentially are journeying in the same way and we're starting these projects for the same reason. And to me, it was not really, I mean, it was about the material at first, but it became more about myself at some point during the whole thing. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's nice to hear that I have something in common with somebody I obviously have never met too. So and with a similar subject matter as well, although you have a, a much firmer grasp on hermeticism specifically than I do. And that resource, uh, your encyclopedia series is, is uh, I'll link to it in the show notes, but it's well worth people's time if they're interested in this subject at all. And also, you were just talking about your academic approach to the material. Is that the only approach you have? Or do you have a day-to-day a -day ritual magical practice? Or do you do psychedelic journeying on some level or shamanic journeying or however you want to phrase it? Like, do you do any of these things in practice in your day-to-day -day life? Well, I don't know if I would call it day-to-day -day life because this is one when it comes to taking a metaphysical journey, that's something that happens maybe a few times a year. And that's kind of how I like it because if you spend too much time in those realms, you can often disconnect. And I've seen a lot of darkness in this world emerge from people disconnecting from meat space, if you will. And that's kind of where I've come to terms with my position on, you know, life affirmation, you know, not a denial of the flesh. Uh, asceticism is all right in moderation. You know, I, I take more to the middle path. So I, I like to think I'm somewhat influenced by Buddhism and Eastern philosophy, but only to the extent that it can be rendered into Western concepts. And those, when you borrow them over into our languages, they get conditioned by other traditions. So by Stoicism or by Epicureanism or by Christianity or Platonism and I am eclectic in my philosophy. It's difficult for me to pin myself down because every time I think that I am one thing, I hear the opposing arguments and then I switch. One thing I do identify with, though, is uh, Christianity. So I am a Christian. I'm not Catholic. I'm not a, a, of any particular denomination. I don't even go to church. I used to. I grew up in a Christian household, and so it kind of conditions the world that I exist in. Everybody I know, uh, extended family, all of my ancestors, I practice the religion of my forefathers, and that definitely influences how I see the world. So, you know, in my 20s, I spent a lot of time trying to do religious window shopping and looking at different philosophies, different religions. And eventually I realized that in terms of like authenticity of what is true to myself, I reaffirmed my Christian background. And that helped me understand things like Renaissance Hermeticism in a much clearer way. Because so many people who study Hermeticism in the Renaissance see it as this counterculture to Christianity, and that's totally not correct. 
it, it was a definitely informed by Christianity, but a more mystical side of it. You know, Dionysius the Areopagai, you have all of these different mystics and philosophers from the Neoplatonic tradition who, like St. Augustine, for example, who have very elaborate and deep minds and also associate with a Trinitarian doctrine. For me, I spent so much time racking my brain thinking like, oh, well, you know, which side do I fall on? Is it materialism? Is it pantheism? Is it panentheism? Is it, you know, there are all these different views. And then finally, I realized that the only religion that straddles this dichotomy between the idealist and the materialist spheres is this religion that I grew up in. And so I stopped accepting it in, I should say, I grew up Protestant, and I'm very disillusioned with modernity and Protestantism. It's very plastic to me. That isn't to say that there aren't great people within Protestant churches and people who do great work in the community and kind people. But the problem is that there is no numinous or mystical element to that whatsoever. And I don't know when that happened, because if you go back and you look at people like Jakob Burma or people like John Dee or people like Pico della Mirandola or people like Vicino, they have very sophisticated and mystical Christianities, forms of Christianity that you would never even recognize in a modern Protestant uh, environment. So that played a big part in, in conditioning how I was thinking about things. I don't know what I call myself these days. I guess a heterodox Christian is one way of thinking about it. I, I'm not part of any particular community, but I feel a sense of fraternity with other Christians for the most part when they're not doing awful things like enslaving nuns in sex slave rings or things like that. I don't know if you've heard about that, but there's just, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the church and um, not terribly interested in that. I, I am more interested in liturgical religion. So the Orthodox and the Catholic traditions, but even then I I've not become a member of any of those groups. I just tend to have a respect for them and I study them from a scholarly perspective and uh, yeah, that's something that informs how I think another vector, of course, as I mentioned before, is Buddhism, which I feel quite strongly about most of its precepts. And I feel like it's um, a good way of developing an ethic because uh, I, I don't allow government or the written law to govern how I'm going to act. I need to have certain principles with which to act. And those are not going to be subject to people writing pieces of paper that decide, you know, whether I'm going to go to jail or not. I have to live in a way that is not causing harm. And these kinds of ideas that I got from the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path, those are really useful in conjunction with the teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, which to me, that really summarizes my Christianity. It's, it's, a, it's a very much a Sermon on the Mount kind of Christianity. I'm, I'm not too interested in all of the other trappings. And uh, so that's why I would consider myself heterodox, um, not heretical or, you know, anti-Christian necessarily, but um, of, a, of a more flexible persuasion. You said a phrase in there, the counterculture to Christianity. Man, that's one thing that I've, as I've gotten more into Hermeticism and, and the occult at large, is it's almost like it's two sides of the same coin. You know, it's it's a very sort of, it's Christian occultism on some level, at least that's how mm -hmm. I am dealing with it or thinking about it these days. And you mentioned the new translation of the uh, Picatrix that you guys published, you and uh, David Pareka. And that's actually why you're here, to talk a little bit about that. And I, I do want to dig into that text, but I want to pose the same question about how you discovered Hermeticism to the Picatrix. How and when did you first discover this text? So as far as the Picatrix is concerned, David is wholly 100% responsible for introducing me to the text. 
I was doing my master's in 2011 and 2012 at Waterloo, and he was my supervisor. And so he got a research grant for a lump sum of money, basically to hire a person on to do research under him. And since I was his grad student, it kind of just fell to me. He said, oh, I'm working on this book of astral magic and you'd probably be interested in it. At the time I was working on mystery cults and he said, you know, this isn't a mystery cult thing, but obviously there are certain parallels and things that would interest you, especially the Neoplatonic bend to it, right? Picatrix is ultimately a a work of Neoplatonic philosophy from the Arabic world. And so he hired me on and he had already started translating it. And basically I was going to help him give birth to the finished work. And so we worked on it for two years after that and then took a break. I, I moved to Los Angeles for two years and then I came back to Canada and we decided to get back into it and Finally, we we pushed it through into a finished form, and that took a lot of work and a lot of patience, And but it was also a lot of fun because David and I would basically get together. We would sit in a room together, and we would work on this giant puzzle, and years later, the puzzle is done, and our labors are now in a nice object that we can hold and that people can read. And that's really satisfying, I guess. So my relationship to the text was nil. It was the fact that I was a Latin trained grad student, right? So it was sort of like whatever your supervisor has on the go for his research, they usually hire their grad students to work with them, whether they're grad students or specialists in that thing or not. That doesn't matter because it's what matters is can you read the text? Can you decipher what it says? And, you know, if you have the skills and the training and you have access to dictionaries like Zucange, which is a medieval dictionary for medieval Latin, you can work on these things and then gradually flesh that picture out. So I, you know, eventually connected all the dots, but it really did take some time to flesh it out because it's such a massive, massive world. The Picatrix is composed of 224 sources. And it was written over, I think, a six-year span of time. And so if you want to get a historical grasp of what are the constituent historical forces that make up the Picatrix, you've got to do a lot of digging because its sources range from numerous religions, numerous languages, and there is no you know, one culture produced this artifact. It's it's definitely a synthesis of numerous endeavors of numerous cultures, and numerous languages, and numerous religions. So I guess having had a background in some Islamic history, having had a background in Latin, having had a background in Gnosticism and mystery cults and Platonism and Neoplatonism, that was my link. It was like, oh, you... You know about all of these things that are tangential to this topic. Now let's go and explore this topic. And that's kind of how I initiated myself into the work. I had a good teacher and I did it largely from a philological approach. So there are several other translations of this text. You mentioned them in the intro to your translation with David. And because of that, I'm wondering why I guess you guys wanted to translate the text in the first place, knowing that there are so many others available. Well, we didn't when we started. David didn't know there were other versions because there weren't other versions when he started. The version that was published, there's one version by Ouroboros Press by a gentleman whose name I'm not sure of. But that version was from the Ritter Plesner German translation of the Arabic version. And so that was not the Pingree Latin edition, or that was not the Latin edition, which had influenced the West. This is not the version that Pico de la Mirandola read and ultimately rejected, or the view that Marsilio Ficino read or that Agrippa read. They read the Latin translation, which 
has changes. It has interpolations. It has, for example, uh, a big section by Geber or Jabir ibn Hayyan from the Flos Naturarum that is interpolated. It does not exist in the Arab text. There are a number of interpolations. There are a number of things that are removed from the Latin translation. Anything that smacks too much of Islam was cut out because of a Christian audience that would be receiving the text. And so there really is place for translation of the Latin edition, which makes up one stream of reception, the stream that went into Europe. And then there's a place for the translation of the Hayat al-Hakim, which is what circulated in the Arabic world. And now Liana Saif is working on the translation of the Hayat al-Hakim using actual manuscripts, doing a, a critical edition. The other edition that was out, there was a French version by Beatrice Bakush and company. And there was also an Italian version and another version in English that was published by Greer and Warnock. And that version was made for practicing occultists. And I mean, it should be noted that when we started the Picatrix, or when David started the Picatrix, rather, he did so because there were all of these books being written about it. People were talking about it, but there wasn't really an edition that was out. And by the time he was like halfway through or three quarters done, Greer and Warnock published their version. But, you know, we weren't just going to stop because it we knew that it was a different take. There was a different um, approach to it. We were interested in the history of it. So kind of looking at and this you see it mainly in the introduction. But our intentions were to create a version that was this is the Latin version that went into Europe, whereas with Greer and Warnock, you get a version that is more geared toward getting your maximum ritual bang for your buck. So, for example, there are some additional in the Liber Rubeus, there are some additional works from Ibn Washia uh, on poisons. So that's that was not originally part of the Picatrix. In their notes, for example, you'll see a lot of cross-referencing with the Arabic version to get you an ac a more accurate picture of what the Arabic text says. But because the European audience didn't read that version, we're not really interested in it. So we're trying to come at it from a kind of purity, if you will, that is only received in, in the Latin world, because we're trying to give people a sense of what Ficino read, what Pico would have read, what was the work that emerged in the 1450s that was influential among the humanists. And by influential, I don't necessarily mean accepted wholeheartedly and positively, right? I mean, they dealt with it and they wrestled with it. And a lot of the problems in the Christian world in wrestling with the Picatrix has to do with issues of free will, because the magic in the Picatrix is this Neoplatonic Aristotelian causal magic that is heavily based on direct causal links that are produced by rays. And this idea that everything is quasi mechanically determined didn't jive well with people who were influenced by the theology of St. Augustine, whereby free will is a necessary component to salvation because you have to choose the theology goes that God extends his grace to you, but you have to reach out and grab it. And that is an act of free will. And that is where you get into incommensurability of worldviews between the worldview of Islamic magic that is, is quasi-mechanical and the view of Christianity, which is very volitional and has a lot to do with the power of the will, but also direct revelation. And in the Islamic world, you also see a, a fracture between that causal form of magic as cobbled together by the Brethren of Purity, Al-Kindi, and Abu Mashar. And then you have a later type of magic by people like Al-Buni, like the Shams, which is semiological. And that's more influenced by Sufism 
So if we were to call the magic of the Pegatrix, we would call it Neoplatonic or Hellenistic or um, syncretic magic, whereas the magic that is semiological and Sufic in nature, we can call that Islamic magic. And we have a similar thing going on in the Renaissance where we have people practicing this causal form of magic, but then we have other people who are denying that and saying, no, it's magic is revealed. Like you're really just being fooled by demons. And the truth is something that is revealed to you. It's not something that you achieve by degree. And so the idea of the Pegatrix, it's called in the Arabic form, the goal of the sage or the aim of the sage. And the idea is that you're climbing up this ladder or staircase of the intellect and getting closer and closer to God as you climb these ladders of intellect. Whereas in the revelationatory scheme of things, it's an on or off switch. It's not a gradient. You don't get closer to God because he's wholly transcendent. You either have it or you don't. And that kind of view becomes very strong, especially under people like Savonarola, with whom Pico was very good friends. And eventually they write, Pico and Savonarola together, write a book denouncing astrology. And a lot of people, when they think of Pico, they think of his younger days as being exemplary of his life. But, you know, before his death, he spent a lot of his time kind of renouncing knowledge. He wanted to be barefoot and wander in a black cloak going through Italy and hanging out with poor people. Uh, he wanted to live the life of a Dominican monk and and thought that all of his knowledge was kind of vain. Because, again, it was either on or off. It was revealed or not revealed. It was not something that you could gradually synthesize by taking bits and pieces from other people's religions and philosophies and eventually come to this coherent picture. That's what Pico thought he could do in his younger days. And later on in his life, he rejected that. So Pegatrix is interesting because as far as in its European reception context, because it, it plays a role in all of these debates. Very few people name the Pegatrix outright. So if you read Ficino and his three books on life, I think he mentions Pegatrix in his letters, but in his three books on life, he just says the Arabs. He says, oh, this I got from the Platonists and the Arabs. And from there, he means Picatrix, he means Jabir ibn Hayyan, he means Abu Mashar, he means Al-Kindi. And that is a kind of magic that is inherited from antiquity and also elaborated in the world of Islam and then received in the West. And our translation tries to capture this process of reception. And, and I mean... Ultimately, it may differ in some regards in terms of certain ingredients are different, certain ritual components are different, some things are just translated differently, right? So, you know, you've got the King James version of the Bible, but you also have a hundred other versions of the Bible, and each one has their own value in some respect or another and have a different purported aim or goal. And that's kind of what we're doing with the Pegatrix is trying to focus on this idea of European reception. I've seen some people saying that we should, for example, acknowledge our debt of cultural appropriation and not call the work the Pegatrix. We should call it the Hayat al-Hakim. And I disagree with this completely because they're different texts. They're different traditions. They influence different people. And if we try to collapse them into one stream, what we're, we're doing an ahistorical mistake where we're trying to compress this rich diversity of thought into, into one thing. And also when you're talking about ideas of cultural appropriation in terms of magic, like who's doing the appropriate, aren't you appropriating the magic of 15th century Spaniards or Italians? You know, who is appropriating from whom when a work is composed by 224 sources from tons of different cultures? It just it gets really complicated. And 
if people are concerned with that, they should just not have the book at all and make up their own thing. Right. And then (laughs) I think that then they don't have to deal with any problems of appropriation. But I mean, that's, these are political debates that will never be settled because everybody has a different perspective on how these problems ought to be solved and resolved. So yeah, that that's basically why we have our own edition. I mean, I didn't start it, right? David Pereka was a member of the Societas Magica, so he was running in circles with people like Richard Kiekeffer, Claire Fanger, Frank Clausen, and these people are all working on stuff that tangentially touches on Picatrix. And so you see this name coming up again and again and again, and you don't see that there's an edition that's out. So he got to work, and then... I'm not sure when the Greer Warnock version came out, maybe 2011. And by that time, we had already produced a whole three quarters of a book. So we weren't going to turn back then. And yeah, that sort of explains how I got into that and how David got into that. It was basically wanting to create an edition that people could use in conjunction with the Pingree and follow along with the Latin So we use the same numbering systems, we have an index, and hopefully we make it easy for people who are trying to do research in these subjects. It's worth saying here that the Picatrix was translated from Arab into Castilian Spanish at the court of Alfonso X, and then shortly into Latin thereafter, and the Spanish copy does not survive. We have some fragments of it, but that's about it. And then that Latin copy quickly circulated all throughout Europe, and we find manuscripts stretching from Poland to Germany to France to southern France, Spain, Italy. So you have this book going around all of Europe, but only the Latin version. And when a translator translates, they have to use concepts that are equivalent concepts, but they may not necessarily carry the same meaning. There are these intertextualities that arise. So, for example, Liana Saif is working on the translation of the Hayat al-Hakim, and she uses the word ruhania and doesn't translate that into spirit because she feels that the word spirit doesn't capture the complexity of the ruhania and how different they are from traditional Western notions of spirit. But that distinction would not matter to a European audience, right? They would understand a spirit through the lens of the traditions that they understood. So these are things like pseudo Dionysus. These are reconceptualizations of magic along the lines of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas and Roger Bacon. The way that Europeans think about magic definitely colors the text reception and That's what we are trained to deal with because we are familiar with Europe, with the Middle Ages. You know, David Preka is a medievalist and I study the Renaissance currently for my PhD. And so the idea was that it was born out of studying these time periods and how it was received because, yeah, the Arabic text never was existed in Europe. So it's not really relevant to understanding what European magi were interested in, what they were reading, what they were concerned with. So it's just uh, adding a dimension of historicity to it. Didn't you also say that some of the European Renaissance scholars, you know, like Ficino and Pico, may not have been too fond of this text? No, they they hated it. Well, not Ficino. Ficino was wary. So I should mention that during the 13th century, there's a bifurcation in magic. That happens. You have with the 12th century Renaissance and the Crusades, a link between the West and the East, and especially with these translation movements in the courts of Islamic Spain, you have all of these books coming into the West, and Europeans are forced to deal with these in light of their religious beliefs. And so, in negotiating with these texts, they come up with this idea that there is natural magic, magia naturalis. And that there is demonic magic. And so what is done through magical sympathies and correspondences is natural and fine. It operates through rays. And they understood this 
through the work of Alkindis de Radis, Roger Bacon, Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas, they were all familiar with Alkindis de Radis. And so they said, oh, well, that's nature. We're not worried about that. It's when you are writing sigils and secret languages on talismans that are trying to communicate with demons. These are not Ruhania. These are not these volitional forces up in the sky that are directing rays. These are demons, as traditionally understood in Christianity. And so magic bifurcates into the kind that is kosher and the kind that is not kosher. And Pacino is a member of this tradition, of this way of thinking. So for him, he's fine with making talismans. He's fine with using cures, with using stuff in the Picatrix that seems like what he would consider natural magic. But he warns people in his letters, don't do the demonic stuff. Like there are conjuration spells that come from the Sabaeans, and these are like invoking Saturn by like suffumigating with a mixture of compounds and dressing up in black robes and singing a hymn to Saturn. So Ficino practiced that, but he was cautious and he was very, very cautious of roping other people into that sort of thing. And then when it comes to Pico, he just didn't like astrology outright. And for the reasons I covered earlier, where his view was colored by prophecy and by this kind of spiritual gnosis idea that it's on or off. It's it's revealed or it's not revealed. You you are not going to come to an understanding of God through astrology, and you're actually just wasting your time, and it's a vain pursuit. And then this was also taken up by Pico's nephew, Gianfrancesco Pico, who eventually got a hold of Pico's notes, and we actually don't know to what extent Savonarola and Gianfrancesco Pico tampered with Pico's notes. So it could be that what we think we know about Pico is actually a result of their tampering after Pico's death. But yeah, that remains to be discovered. But in any case, yeah, the Picatrix was not well loved by the literate people. And if it was, then it was not discussed. An example that I often bring up is with John D. people accused him of being a conjurer and he hated it. He despised being called a conjurer. Because presumably there were people that he knew, magicians, who were conjurers, and he thought they were misguided. Now, here he is doing his scrying with Edward Kelly and having his conversations with angels. But in his mind, this is not the same thing as conjuring as it would be found in a Picatrix. And so very quickly, and you could read about this in an article by Honograph, I think it's called Better Than Magic. And it's this idea that the late thinkers of the Renaissance, people like especially Ludovico Lazzarelli, they rediscovered Gnosis. So Gnosis as an idea went underground. And in Ficino, you get an inkling of it because of this platonic idea of madness. And so Ficino scratches at it and then Pico scratches at it, but then Lazzarelli comes out and just says it. And Lazzarelli was directly influenced by both Ficino and Pico. And the important thing is that Lazzarelli is the link to Agrippa. Agrippa read Ludovico Lazzarelli and was very interested in what he had to say about Kabbalah and magic. It's just that his magic is not this talismanic astral kind of magic. It's more of this Kabbalistic revealed prophetic magic. So hopefully that answers to some extent your question. Yeah, it definitely does. And I I definitely wanted to point that out to the listeners because it was kind of surprising to me because I hadn't really got that deep into, you know, Ficino and Pico and guys like that and what they thought of a text like this. And then you guys put that in there uh, in the intro to to the book. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. It really resonates with me too, just in terms of, you know, avoiding certain types of spell and ritual, for example. So, you know, also something too that I found interesting that you guys wrote about was you said that the text is fascinating uh, to intellectual and religious historians 
I think it's pretty obvious why that is, but you also said it's it's no less interesting to critical social historians. Why would a text about astral magic, why would a text like that, at least on the surface, you know, be so interesting to social historians? Right. So when we look at a text of magic, what we're looking at is an inverted impression of desire. We're looking at what a compendium of things that people want to do and achieve, but are powerless to achieve them by normal means. And so what we can do by scanning the Pegatrix and, and peeling back the layers is understand the values of, of the people who produce the work. Now, of course, we can't figure out what the values of farmers are or something like that, but we can figure out what the value of a court magician in the 10th century would be interested in. And you can do that by doing statistical analyses. And, and that was largely David's work. He was He's more of a number crunching guy. And so he was the one who came up with the tables and the graphs and the charts that make up the introduction because he wants to know what it is people are desiring and, and powerless to achieve. And I think that magic is totally an untapped area of study because of a number of prejudices against magic that would help to get people to understand uh, the medieval mind better and how people inhabited worlds different from ours and they had different desires or sometimes very similar ones. Some desires transcend time and space, it seems. So that, I think, is how the Picatrix can be useful to social historians if they're looking for examples of, of how people want things. The other thing is that you get into idea of trade networks, of material culture, right? Like, I'm an ideas guy, so I'm really not a material cultures person. I've done some archaeological work. I've been on some digs in Romania, for example. But largely, I'm a minimalist. I'm not really interested in stuff. I'm more of an ideas kind of guy. David, on the other hand, is more so interested in material, in stuff, and in trade networks, and in systems of exchange, and economic flows, and energy flows. These are the kinds of things that he's interested in. And so that's why Picatrix should be explored by social historians, because you get so much information about plants and animals and food and spices and smells and, you know, what is desirable and what is not desirable. You know, what are people's attitudes towards magic? To what extent do they have to hide this? To what extent is it open? Those sorts of things. So there's a lot of information you can tease out of a book like this without having to be looking for your next operation necessarily. Yeah. And to tie this back to I guess maybe the the nature of the text. You mentioned this earlier about similarities between Hermeticism and Gnosticism, and some may think of this text as Hermetic, some may think of it as Gnostic, but you say it's actually encompassed best by a term called Platonic Orientalism. What is that concept exactly? Right. So this is a concept that we borrow from Wouter Honograph, and what it means in its barest essence, without getting into it too much, it means platonic philosophy understood as revealed wisdom from the East. So the idea is that because the Picatrix is a compendium of various sources of numerous philosophical schools, but the most predominant one is the Neoplatonic theology of Aristotle, which is from a work called the Pseudo-Aristotelian Hermetica, and that was produced by the Brethren of Purity sometime in the 8th century. And they were a secret society based out of Baghdad that was very interested in Neoplatonism. And so what they did was they absorbed, or let's say paraphrased, Plotinus and came up with this system of astral magic by doing an exegesis of Plotinus, especially this idea of sympathetic resonances the doctrine of signatures, the idea of emanation is absolutely necessary to the magic that undergirds the Picatrix. 
And so you have all of these different concepts that are fundamental to Platonic philosophy, fundamental to Aristotelianism as well. But I don't necessarily see Aristotelianism and Platonism as fully opposite to each other. The Aristotelianism and Platonism of late antiquity was definitely more so Platonized, more mystical. And that's what found its way into the Arabic world. And so it's this idea that these doctrines that come from Plato, which, you know, everybody has a different theory about where Plato got his ideas. you got the crowd who say that he stole them from Egypt. You've got the crowd that say that he stole them from the Persians. But the point is that before Plato, nobody languaged his doctrines in a way that became contagious throughout the entire world, right? Zoroastrianism may posit the things that Platonism posits, but Zoroastrianism did not spread these things to the four corners of the earth. They spread to the four corners of the earth through Platonism and through this not this post-Enlightenment rationalist vision of a Plato as this academician in a white robe doing mathematics and engaging in reasoned dialogue, but as a mystical initiator, as a religious teacher. That's the kind of Plato that is conceived in late antiquity, and that's also the Plato that is conceived by the Brethren of Purity, by Al-Qurtubi, the author of the Hayat al-Hakim, the Plato of the Spanish court, the Plato of Ficino, the Plato of Pico. Their conception of Plato was as this oriental sage who was endowed with gnosis, essentially. And that really is the constituent factor in the Picatrix, the emanationary worldview the doctrine of correspondences, these are fundamentally Platonic concepts. And so, yeah, we call that Platonic Orientalism. And a lot of people, they get confused when people use the term Platonic Orientalism because it overlaps with this idea of Edward Said's Orientalism, which is a whole other issue of post-colonial literary theory, which we don't need to get into. But needless to say that it's not the same thing. So people will often criticize the idea of Platonic Orientalism with the criticisms that they would levy against Edward Said's Orientalism. And it's just, we're not talking about the same thing here. We're talking about the idea of Platonic philosophy as received wisdom from the East, whether real or not. What are some of the other philosophies and teachings that we see syncretized in this text there's a lot, right? So you would need essentially a graph. And I actually have a graph here. Let's see if I can pull it out and then I can explain. This graph was actually put together by Liana Seif and it's super useful. I unfortunately don't have a picture of it and probably shouldn't reproduce it since it's her graph. But what it shows is a series of concentric circles. And this is how the philosophy of the Picatrix was constructed. So at the very center of the circle, we have the pseudo-Aristotelian Hermetica. And so that's these commentaries on Plotinus's Aeneids 4 through 6 that are really at the foundation of this doctrine of emanations and this idea of sympathetic correspondences. And so that's really important that's like a cornerstone or a central part of the picatrix and it's often cited now then you go down one concentric sphere lower than that and you have ibn washia jabir ibn hayyan and the ikhwan al-safa so the brethren of purity ibn washia was the writer of the nabataean agriculture so he was well he spoke arabic he was a Nabataean, so let's say a North Arab, and they were more adherents to the religion of Babylonian paganism, essentially, before the Arabs 
invaded their lands and converted them all to Islam. So Ibn Washia was a Muslim, but he was very interested in maintaining the knowledge of the ancient Chaldeans and try to like keep that alive because he thought that the new knowledge of the Arabs was barbarous. So one of the sources that gets ab- absorbed into the Pigatrix is this Ibn Washia's works, the Chaldean agriculture. We then have Jabir Ibn Hayyan in the Latin Pigatrix, for example, the Flos Naturarum is one of these works that gets intercalated into the Picatrix. That section does not exist in the Hayat al-Hakim. It was interpolated at Montpellier. And so, and then you have the Brethren of Purity and, and their writings. So that forms the magical core. And then you have below that Aristotle, Pseudo-Apollonius, Al-Farabi, and again, the Brethren of Purity, who form this idea of the harmony of the microcosm and the macrocosm, which is an absolutely vital part of the magic of the Picatrix. And then you go down another ring, and now you could say we're in the celestial world, and here we're getting into Ptolemy, Abu Mashar, Aristotle, Ibn Nushia, and again, the Ikhwan al-Safa. But This is the like astrological works. So you have a lot, especially like the Tetra Biblos or these these really classic works of Ptolemy that are integral to the astrology part of the work. And then lastly, the sort of foundation of everything is Plotinus, Aristotle, Alpha Rabi, and Pseudo Empedocles, and again the Ikhwan al Safa, the Brethren of Purity. But the so the pseudo Empedocles, these are these ideas of love and hate or attraction and repulsion, which create motion. And that motion cascades down the celestial spheres in the form of heat, of elemental heat. And that's what causes the spheres to move and it sets the entire system in motion. And so you see that like you can't really construct the worldview of the Picatrix without looking at all these different Greek, Indian, Arabic, Chaldean, Persian sources. So it's, it's important to parse this and understand all of the different constituent pieces. And that is fair, and I appreciate you throwing that at us. Please do tell the audience, Dan, where they can find this new translation of the Picatrix and where they can keep up with you and your work as well. So the Picatrix is available on Amazon and it is available on the Penn State University Press website. It should be simple enough to find. And uh, you can find me at both Twitter and YouTube. So all of my lecture material is on YouTube at youtube.com slash the modern hermeticist. And then my Twitter is at modern hermetics. I also have a website, which is the modern hermeticist.com. And other than that, I want to say thank you very much for having me on Ryan. And I really appreciate the time I've been given to talk. Well, thank you for your time and the kind words there. I'll link to all of that stuff in the show notes, and I look forward to talking to you again sometime, Dan. Uh, Maybe we can dig further into the Encyclopedia Hermetica sometime. Absolutely. And there you have it. My thanks again to Dan Attrell. My thanks to all of you who made it this far. And I'll tell you, if you have any interest whatsoever in Western esotericism or the occult or ancient philosophy, check out this translation of the Picatrix. It's a fascinating read with a comprehensive introduction and overview of the text, uh, which you got a taste of here. And not much to really add to this. Dan is a well-read and well-researched dude, an impressive thinker and philosopher and speaker in his own right. And I would highly recommend you check out his website and YouTube videos as well. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, another 50 minutes or so with Dan where we talked about the morality and ethics of the Picatrix, Negromancy versus Necromancy, the hierarchy of beings in the Picatrix, the concept of perfect nature. We tried to figure out what the hell the quadrivium actually is, talked a little bit about the original author of the Arabic text, the intentions of the original author, the concept of God in the Picatrix and in magic, uh, the type of rituals in the text, and the role of psychoactive substances in those rituals. 
And a shout out to new patrons, Ned and Nebula. And a huge thank you to Kyle, who became the newest executive producer of the show. Hey, check out patreon.com slash oldculture if you're interested in hearing the extension with Dan here and joining these fine folks and helping monetarily support the show here. And also, apologies for the larger than usual gap between shows here, but I have been busy outside the office, so to speak, and I don't want to say this is the new normal, but please do bear with me while I uh, get my shit together, as they say where I'm from. Hey, but we will have another one of these very soon with returning guest Recluse, so do hit subscribe or hit up that Patreon to hear that episode before anyone else. Until then, though, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.